In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I have to tell you, this was a tough one to preach on today. Divorce is such a painful thing, and um, it took me a while. So let's see what I came up with. <laughs> From hearing about respecting and loving children and little ones, those who are new to their faith in God and in following Jesus, we hear this passage in Mark that talks about divorce. We can say that the Bible does not cover every aspect of human life. Divorce is a very painful part of life and it is not to be treated lightly. With the reference to Moses in regards to divorce, we understand that this is not a legal invention of modern times. What is Jesus trying to say about the splitting of the ways between husband and wife? Let's first go back to our reading from Genesis today. This is the second account of the creation of humankind. Yes, that's right. There are two accounts side by side about how humankind came into being. Everyone is familiar with the opening of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. We hear about the number of days that bring about the transformation of this formless void, and how God brought in the light, and all the wondrous things that make up this world of ours. Then this marvelous reporting about humankind appeared on earth in these two stories appears. How does a Bible literalist live with this tension? The first version in the latter part of chapter 1 tells us that God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and master it and rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the living things that creep on earth. This is a translation of the Torah. So together, men and women, plural and equal. The second story, of course, is the one that usually gets quoted, especially in the patriarchal society. That is what we have today in our reading. Adam is created first, and then from his rib, Eve is created to be a husband. <coughs> In weddings, this next part is sometimes selected. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. On the surface, this describes a very close bond for man and woman to have. But unfortunately, it became a tool to discriminate against women in the years to follow. Women were seen less than man because Adam was first, and he was described as coming from him. W.G. Plout writes that according to Jewish interpretation, the creation of woman becomes in effect the beginning of man's social history. Man is able to fulfill his destiny completely only as a social being. Aloneness, in turn, is man's primary helplessness. Woman is more than man's female counterpart. Like his rib, she is part of him, part of his structure, and without her, he is essentially in the Talmud says, he is called man only if he has a wife. However, the Bible does not see man and woman as equals. The Torah tradition is frankly male-oriented. In the Old Testament, in the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, we will find several passages that continue this notion of non-equal status. In the New Testament, in letters attributed to Paul, but not actually his, there are sections that place women in an inferior status to men. Some early Christian patriarchs constantly admonished women due to the part that he played in the expulsion from Eden. All women were tainted because of this, even though Adam certainly participated, and even though Adam and Eve were not actual historical people. So we come to Mark's passage about divorce. Once again, the Pharisees try to catch Jesus in a trap and decide to test him. In front of the crowds, again, gathered around him while Jesus began to teach. This was an opportunity to show that Jesus was not on the right track, and it was an attempt to shame Jesus and show everyone in that crowd that Jesus was wrong. So they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus immediately follows their question with a 
question of his own. What did Moses command you? Oh, they know this one by heart, he replied. Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal, a get, and to divorce her. Jesus must have shook his head at their pat retort. Yes, Moses allowed this, but at what cost to the sacred union between husband and wife? Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate or put asunder, something that we continue to use in our wedding liturgy. Why would there be divorce back then if marriage was a sacred event? Well, if a woman did not produce a child, especially a boy, of course it was always her fault. <laughs> then, <laughs> then a man could divorce her. A woman could leave her husband if things were not going well in the bedroom, but usually a divorced woman had little choice but to return to her father's house. And if there had been children, she could not have them, no contact with them at all. She could not go to a priest, which kept her outside the religious and social community. Again, Jesus tried to champion those who were seen as less than in the eyes of the communities. <coughs> we have heard him talk about the children and the new ones to the faith. Jesus wanted the disciples to understand that this action of divorce meant both ways. It was not to be a one-sided reaction to a divorce. Jesus treated the situations equally. Both divorce parties would be responsible for the breakup of the marriage. Was Jesus being harsh in this explanation? How does a divorced man or woman feel about this? Even though we believe matrimony to be a sacred sacrament with vows being made, we know there are situations that make it impossible for couples to stay married. If attempts to reconcile the differences fail or if there is violence present within the marriage, divorce may be necessary. In the Episcopal Church, a divorced person was never seen outside the church community. Excommunication is not a part of the decision to divorce, nor a person denied the Eucharistic sacrament. If a person wanted to remarry, the priest would get permission from the bishop to allow this second marriage. Even today, permission must be obtained through the bishop if a prior marriage has dissolved in divorce. Both parties of the dissolved marriage should be treated with love, kindness, and dignity. This passage, I am sure, is used against divorce couples today. To do so misses the point. Jesus was trying to show that in the patriarchal society of his day, there still must be equal treatment of the man and the woman. Jesus also wanted to remind his followers that if God intended that man and woman be united in a committed relationship, then we humans need to be careful how we try to put human reactions to these committed relationships. Again, there are divorces that are necessary for the survival of either spouse and sometimes even to provide a healthier environment for the children. Marriage should never be rushed into for that reason. Do we know everything about our future mate before we marry? Absolutely not. <laughs> do we encounter difficult situations in our, in our marriages? Yes, we do. If there is a possibility for a genuine reconciliation where there is no violence, either physical or psychological, and that is the path we should try. If divorce is what needs to happen, then an acknowledgement of this death of the relationship needs to be seen. If there is a possibility to work out the differences, the things that rub each other along, then there needs to be an attempt to find common ground. From her blog, The Biting the Apple, Nancy Rockwell writes, in the first century CE, before birth control and before women had access to the economy independently of men, divorce was a death sentence, sometimes literally from starvation and exposure and always socially from shame. In our time when the economy, our understanding of sexuality, our ability to control fertility and the law have changed, when our life expectancy has doubled, and when we no longer live in plans of love relations, marriage expectations have changed. Once again, 
Jesus championed the person who had a difficult status. Because of his love for all and for his love to those especially ostracized by society, Jesus wanted to do what he could to change the attitudes of the Pharisees who just wanted to find him on the wrong side of the law. Once again, they failed in their attempt to entrap Jesus. Let us pray again from Stephen Shakespeare. God of the living law, whose will is to protect the weak and educate our desires, may we learn from you not to dominate or put aside, but to give each other dignity and find in you our unity. Through Jesus Christ, who makes us one household. 